on the tip of my tongue. Then my little bite my Welcome, everybody, to an impromptu edition of Two Goalies, One Mike, episode 154. Uh, we recorded last night after the Sabres game, and uh, I think we both agreed that we didn't think this day would be coming anytime soon. And then less than 24 hours, the Sabres relieve head coach, former head, now former head coach, Don Granado, of his duties. Um released from the team uh, this morning. Uh, but before we get to that, remember this is brought to you by Fatty Beer Company, Western New York's premier market and tap room with over 300 beers to choose from at eight Western New York locations. Make sure you go check them out. One of Western New York's only kid and dog friendly bars open 11.30 a.m. and 10.30 p.m. and later uh, with live music, entertainment, trivia at all eight locations. And Buffalo Go Apparel, I mean, one of the greatest spots to get any of your uh, – Buffalo sports apparel needs, uh, when it's the Sabres, the Bills, the Bandits, the Bisons, um, they have everything there. Um, shirts, your hats, your hoodies, make sure you check them out at Buffalo Go Pro on Instagram and Twitter, at Fetty Beer on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, Hurls, uh, quite, quite, quite the day here, and I think we got an echo on your side of it. Yeah, well, we're going to have to do with it, but uh, is it better or no? Well, I'm not going. Oh, I think well, I'm good now. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hear a like, I hear like slightly in the background. Doesn't but, sound like it to me, at least. But uh, yeah. yeah, well, impromptu for now. I I have a janky setup here. We'll have we'll just have to figure it out. But um, yeah, uh, pretty crazy. Uh, something that I think we all expected potentially at the beginning of next season if they got off to a slow start. But less than twelve hours after the season ends, they uh, they get rid of Don Granato. So. Uh, Tells you a lot about what their thought process was for the past month or so. I think uh, Kevin Adams uh, explained his thought process pretty well today, actually, in his press conference. We can get into that a little bit more. But definitely surprising, given given what we had thought was going to happen. But 
when you really get down to it, the expectations were there and they were not met. So from that perspective, not too surprising. And uh, I think we can all agree that it was the appropriate time. And now they move forward, trying to find a guy that, as Kevin Adams said, has NHL head coaching experience. He made it pretty clear today. So a lot of options, and uh, I'm sure we will get into that. Yeah, we listed those options um, earlier on Twitter. Uh, you'd think probably names at the top of that list would be guys like Craig Berube, um, you know, one of the more decorated coaches that were fired uh, this past season uh, out of St. Louis. Uh, we all remember uh, St. Louis's run to a cup after being in the basement. And, you know, they find a goalie who got hot, whether you like him or not. Jordan Bennington was the best goalie in the league that year and uh, led them to a Stanley Cup. Um, and, uh, of course, our good old buddy Ryan O'Reilly uh, was right there along for the ride on a, on it, and also winning the Conn Smythe Trophy. So, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I would say his name's top of the list. We're all going to talk about Lindy Ruff. Let's just get out of the way. Like we, we've talked about on this show, we've heard that we've heard the chance for Lindy. Uh, I've seen the signs for Lindy. We've talked about extensively on this show. Uh, I would have to believe at least a conversation will take place between Kevin Adams and Lindy Ruff over the next, you know, weeks, a couple, a uh, few weeks. Cause it does seem like he wants to get this done quicker rather than uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah, I'd say so. The last question of the press conference from our, Good friend Matthew Fairburn today was specifically yep. about Lindy Ruff, and he said he didn't want to get into his specific names, but he was leaving that press conference saying that he wanted everybody to know that he does have a plan. So he didn't say no, and I would be led to believe that does include Lindy Ruff because when you have the fifth all-time leader in wins all-time as a head coach in the regular season, and when you add playoffs into that, he goes into fourth, I think, uh, and also – he lives in your backyard. I think he still maintains a residence in Clarence. Yep. I think you would be uh, doing a disservice to your organization and your fan base if he was interested. There's a chance he's not interested. But given how it worked out in New Jersey, I, I would I would reckon that Lindy Ruff does not want to end his coaching career that way. And as we've yeah. said many times, what better way to end this, uh, to finish his story, to finish his story of the head coach and also finish the story of the Sabres head coach. Breaking the longest playoff drought in NHL history and maybe even making a cup run. That would be uh, one for the history books. So I absolutely think they either already have talked to him or they're going to talk to him. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Um, from our good buddy Walt on Sabermetrics, at Sabermetrics on Twitter, he tweeted out earlier, Lindy Ruff has an 82, 49, and 12 record as an NHL co co head coach over the last two seasons. Um, that, that, I mean, if you were to tell me there was a coach in the NHL, uh, you know, any coach, name it doesn't matter who it is, and that was their record over the previous two seasons. I would assume they'd still have an NHL job. Personally, that that's that's a, that's a great record uh, over the course of two full NHL seasons. Um, that being said, I has I think, I think one of the uh, uh, terms or a narrative about him is like he's a dinosaur. You know, uh, he, he's too old school. But from everything we've seen, I mean, I, I before I get into that. I think I think Lindy has been able to adjust to the times um, on how to coach, you know, this newer generation of hockey player. Um, but that being said, I think that they need some old school mentality uh, behind this bench. And I think Kevin Adams spoke a little bit to that. And um, even even so, with that with that press conference, and like I said we'll, we'll get into that extensively. Um, I I kind of got the feeling that Kevin Adams might have felt like a little bit a little bit of heat there. Like he's like he's on the hot seat with the way because if you if you look at last year's press conference, you know the question was asked: Is it playoffs or bust? And he really wouldn't answer the question. He kind of danced around it. And the, the demeanor this time around completely different. Like the time is now. We need to win now. Yeah, I would uh, I would agree with that. I I thought largely his press conference was, was pretty good. It seemed like it was pretty well received. Not only by fans, but also in the media. I can't speak for everyone. Obviously, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that kind of feel like it's all talk and none of it really matters until they actually produce results on the ice, which is completely fair. But in terms of his tone and also what feels like he's been given a little bit more leeway this time from Terry Bagula, I think there's a little bit more of a hands-off approach. 
And I think it's really, really going to be up to Adams and the people that are surrounding him to have full control, full leverage in terms of getting the guy that they want. And it does seem like they have a couple or even a few real clear targets in mind. And honestly, I'd be surprised if they're not the same guys that we're all thinking of. If, it, if it's not Lindy Ruff, if it's not Craig Berube, if it's not Gerard Gallant, if it's not Bruce Boudreau, I think he really, really wants – I mean, he said it flat out with, with no sugarcoating whatsoever that he wants a coach with NHL head coaching experience. That rules out Seth Appert. That rules out Michael Pekka. That rules out Jay McKee. That rules out Ricard Gronberg uh, from overseas. That rules out a lot of guys that we've discussed in the past. Even a guy like David Carl, who has won two championships in the past four months with the University of Denver and the U.S. World Junior Team. Uh, I think that puts you in a much different ballpark than, than we've been in previously. Obviously, we, we've done this with Dan Bilesma, uh, and we've also tried, obviously, first-time head coaches in Phil Housley, Ralph Kruger, and, and Don Granato. But getting a guy with NHL experience, a no-nonsense guy with clear systems in place, seems to be the clear path forward for this organization. And I think everybody can agree for the most part that that's exactly what they need right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could agree with that more. Um, you know, and like you said, uh, Kevin Adams wants experience. And does that I mean, does that rule a Michael Peck out? I mean, I would assume so. Yeah, Do I think he said think pretty clearly that it does. Yeah, yeah. Do you still think that if, if Pekka were to reach out for an interview, do you think Kevin Adams would give it to him? Um, hard to say. I, I think, uh, I'm not necessarily sure how that ended. It, uh, if you weren't able to keep it in the organization in the first place, I can't imagine that it ended well. So maybe that bridge has been burned. Uh, if he did reach out, yeah, maybe interview him, but it does feel like that the resume and, uh, the job experience section that we see on job applications, uh, for this job specifically would say, Three to five years' experience is an NHL head coach required. That's kind of what seems to be the standard moving forward here. And I, for one, am, am pretty happy about that because at a lot of times this season, both from a lineup and a system perspective, it seemed like this team lacked direction. And not even just that, with the power play and game management, in-game management, timeouts, uh, the ability to take control of the game from behind the bench seemed to be lacking. And having a guy with experience in those exact situations in the NHL, I think, is crucial. So, um, yeah, maybe maybe he would give an interview to Michael Peck and Jay McKee for purely just for exploratory purposes. But in yeah. terms of the guy they're going to hire, I think it's going to be a guy with three, four hundred plus games of NHL coaching experience. You would like if for a guy like Peck or McKee to get this job, they would have to absolutely blow them away in the interview. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, you know what I mean, like it, it, they would absolutely have to like you know. You know, almost Herb Brooks it from the movie Miracle when, when he when he showed up for his interview, just kind of blow everyone away. Um, other names on the list: uh, Daryl Sutter, former uh, Calgary coach; Todd McClellan; Elaine Vigneault; Jay Woodcroft; DJ Smith; Jeff Blassell; Lane Lambert; and then, of course, again, Bruce. There it is, Mr. Bruce Boudreau, Gerard Gallant. Uh, some wild cards I had in there were Ryan Warsawski, but I think that, um, judging from, again, as we spoke a couple times already, uh, experience, I think he would be out of the conversation. Mark Savard, also probably out of the conversation. But I think the biggest dark horse here, and it makes me want the Islanders to win in that first round, would be Rod Brindamore. He is still not signed beyond this season, which blows my mind. And that would that guy would be at the top of anyone's coaching list, um, if, if you're if you have a vacancy, which Buffalo does. Yeah, uh, that's something that's been thrown out online all day today, and I, I think it really does depend on what happens. I think Carolina has been in the part of their franchise and the part of their build that they haven't made it over the hump as the Sabers did it in 0506 and 0607, and maybe they're looking to move on with someone new, a fresh voice in the room to eventually get this team that obviously has been very good for four plus four plus years now to get over the hump. And let's say they don't, uh, I think that could be an intriguing situation. He obviously played with Kevin Adams on the Hurricanes on that 06 Cup team. So yeah, I mean, I think anybody would be, would be intrigued by that. But at the same time, 
it would be tough to wait around and ignore these other really, really good candidates while the Hurricanes potentially go on a cup run. I could easily see them uh, winning the cup this season with the way that they've pl been playing, with the addition of Jake Gensel, with uh, the goaltending and the defensive core that they have. I think they are potentially, if not the favorite, they're the number two in the Eastern Conference uh, this, this upcoming playoff. So I guess you can wait and see what happens, but it doesn't seem like Kevin Adams is willing to wait around that long. And I, it, it's a, it just mind blowing to me that that guy could potentially be available. Even at for their first round exit, I know that like the expectations there are, are big for this team. And I know that, you know, maybe they were trying to broach it with uh, maybe he's going to maybe, maybe with a contract hanging in the balance that, He'll uh, be able to. Oh. You got me? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Okay. Uh, maybe with a contract hanging in the balance, maybe he'd be able to get this team over the hump. But he would almost be willing to wait two weeks to see if the Isles, you know, beats. Like, because I think, isn't that what's slated right now down in the Isles? I think so. I saw that today. I'm pretty yeah. sure that's. It, uh... You know, why not wait the two weeks? See if you can get an interview with the guy. He's a free agent. He's going to be a free agent. So maybe per request permission. I, I don't know how that goes about, like when his contract is officially over. Is it over the moment the season's over for Carolina? Is it? Is there a date on it? I don't know. But I really would love to see uh, at least a note. At least. I think that's the guy, right? If he was available today, that's the guy, right? I wouldn't necessarily say definitely the guy. I, I think there are a variety of ways you can look at this. And uh, given his connection to Adams, maybe that would be the favorite. I don't even know if he's my favorite because I think it, it might be your favorite. But at the same time, I haven't paid enough attention to exactly the way he goes about things. And I would like to do a little bit more research myself because I honestly, I haven't really looked into head coaches too often before the past like month or two before we all really, really, truly wanted uh, Don Granado's time to be over. So, yeah, I mean, personally for me, at the moment, I do feel like it's Lindy. Uh, I do feel like he deserves another shot, and I do feel like he kind of got a raw deal in New Jersey, not only from the storyline perspective within the Sabres, but we all know his style. He knows the city. He knows this, he knows this town. He knows the fan base. He knows the media. He's very familiar with a lot of things that a new coach would have to come in and get familiar with. And his combination of that old school toughness, while, as you said, the ability to adapt to the new game and succeed in the present day NHL, which he has done. So I think there's a lot of things at play there that, yeah, everyone may feel like that's a retread, but it's a retread with a guy with a lot of experience that kind of got a raw deal, not only in New Jersey, but I feel like a little bit at the end of his tenure with the Sabres, uh, given the way even those teams in, in 07 kind of fizzled out. With the, with the leaving of, of Jury and Breer. So, yeah, for me personally, I think it's Lindy, and I think it would be for a lot of fans. But, yeah, everybody can have their favorite, and I guess that's why this is so exciting and why when we hook up this morning and we realized that, that this was happening, that it could lead to a lot of different possibilities. It's funny, too, because I was uh... – <laughs> I went live immediately on Twitter. Um, I was in a very, I'm not sure if you listened to that video at all. Um, but I, I went live from my vehicle outside of one of my accounts at work. I'm assuming the service was God awful. And I literally sound like a robot. You cannot stand a word I said for seven minutes or else for seven straight minutes. You could have just guessed what I was talking about, but it was pretty terrible. I did not get a chance to, to hear oh, it myself, but, you know, sometimes we're at the mercy of when news breaks. And I think yeah. you, you did your best and you can be proud of it. Yeah, I did, I did my best. Nobody took anything from it other than what I wrote as the headline. Like, but it, it, yeah. it, was, it was awful. It was almost like Farmer Fran from, uh, from Waterboy. Yeah. Like, well, another guy who did his best that I think we should, uh, should appreciate for a second. Guy on the show. Johnny Falls. Johnny Meatballs, I, I think that while this may have been time, while may, maybe this is absolutely the time to move on, I have a lot of respect for what he came and did for this organization. I think three years ago, 
uh, during the, the midst of that 18 game losing streak. I think it was with Ralph Kruger. And when it was clearly, clearly wasn't working, he came in, he stepped in and did a really good job for a young team that had no direction whatsoever. And I think there are there are points during these three and a half years, these three and a half seasons, where we were all genuinely excited about the direction of this team for the first time in a really, really long time. And I think that's something that should be respected and appreciated among the fan base. Well, yes, we were, we were pretty frustrated this season uh, at many different points, and that's why he got fired, uh, quite frankly. But Don is a very good developmental coach, and he played a part in Tage Thompson becoming a superstar. Alex Tuck's transition into this team after the trade. Rest, Rasmus Dahlin becoming what I believe is a top five defenseman in the, in the NHL, opening up his skill set to being the player that he is today. So, well, yes, it's, it ended in not an ideal fashion. I do think he added a lot to this team and to this current group. And if they do go on to succeed and break this playoff drought and hopefully go on a run here, Don Granato did play a part in that. And I wish him all the best. And I know that he's going to end up somewhere uh, in a, either with an NHL team that is rebuilding, let's say the San Jose Sharks or the Utah, whatever they're going to be called or, or what have you, uh, a young developmental team. I think he'll be really, really good for that situation because I think that's what he does best. Uh, Columbus five, Carolina three, fire Brendan Moore. Um, yeah, listen, I, uh, I agree with all of that. I think that, uh, you know, everything that Don Granado has done for this organization to your points with guys like Tage, especially in Darlene, it can't be understated how much it's going to mean to the future of this franchise and its success. Um, without, I mean, realistically without Don Granado, Tage Thompson doesn't have the year he had last year or even the year before that. Um, and he's probably not the player. He might not, he might never even get moved to center. Um, you know, at all by any head coach, uh, any head coach might not realize, you know, that's where he belonged on the ice and gave him that ability to use his size and his skill and his playmaking ability in that, in that area of the ice. So uh, absolutely a couple of clicks for, for, for Don Granado there. Um, but like Kevin Adams said, um, he got this team to where it, it, where it is. And, but he, he wasn't able to get it to where it needs to be. And they decided to move in a different direction. Yeah, and uh, I think we can all be refreshed and happy that they actually did it because he had the conviction and he had the realization that with his systems or his lack of systems this season that didn't quite click, that moving forward into next season with what they want to do this offseason, that it wasn't going to work. And I, I was pretty happy with the, the bitter tone of the press conference from Adams today and also the accountability with himself. Uh, I thought the media members did a great job of asking the questions that I would have asked. I think a lot of them made it a point that how much of this is on you. And I think Adams obviously he had to do it, but he did a really good job of saying that basically all of this is on me. I didn't do enough this past off season to put this team in the best position to win. And I didn't do enough to potentially even do, do more during the season as well. So Looking yourself in the mirror as a GM, especially as a first-time GM, I think is is really beneficial for Kevin Adams. And yeah, as he said, like if they had a crystal ball on Jack Quinn getting injured twice, they would have done something differently. Sometimes you get you, you get a bad deal, you have some bad luck. But for the most part, I think he was accountable and he has a direction moving forward, which I think is good. And that's all you can do at this point. You get a guy in place with some experience, with some systems, you get these guys acquainted. And then hopefully you add a couple pieces and you start over again in October. But at least for right now, there's a clean slate and you can move forward knowing that from here. Yeah, I I, I can't agree with that more. Um, and I just want to nip this in the bud right away because we've seen his name thrown a lot, like right away, straight up. And I'll get your, your thoughts on that. I want nothing to do, even if he was allowed to, you know, be a candidate. I want nothing to do with Joel Quenville. Sorry. Uh, I, whatever his involvement might have been in Chicago during the Kyle Beach scandal and the cover-up, I want nothing to do with that guy. Um, I don't care how many cups he has. I don't know you know, what type of career he's had. Um, I do not want that toxicity here in Buffalo, um, not just because of the negative, negative uh, 
um, press that the Sabres would get for bringing a guy like him in. I just, I, everybody knows me and how I felt about that situation. Keep any, keep, keep anybody from that staff and anybody, and any, anybody who was in charge of making a decision and, uh, away, away, away from the NHL entirely, all of them. So I just want to nip that one right in the bud right away. Yeah, I would agree. I think that he was fired from a really good team in the Florida Panthers for a reason. That was not a decision that I think was taken lightly, but I think they they executed it pretty swiftly. And now Paul Maurice is, is leading a team that is is one of the cup favorites when they had one of the best coaches or the most winningest coaches in NHL history behind their bench. So, yeah, I, I don't think it's worth it. Um, if, if you could distinctly prove that he had, been, had no involvement whatsoever and he absolutely did the right thing, and you, you have to do a lot to, to meet that standard, and I don't think that's worth it, especially where the Sabres are in, as, an, as an organization right now. So, yeah, I personally, I don't know who's throwing that out there, but I don't think that's going to happen, and it's not even worthy discussing past that. Another yeah. thing I really liked uh, Adam saying today is that they are going to have a power play specialist. Uh, and I think that is absolutely necessary in today's NHL. And, of course, looking at how the Sabres performed on the power play this past season, having a guy to come in there and be creative and be uh, transparent and have the ability to adapt to changing systems and changing defenses to and penalty kills to a power play. I think that's going to be really important, whoever does – be a part of this new coach's staff. Uh, everyone made the joke that Matt Ellis was not one of the people fired today. Uh, it seems like he's going to have a new role in the organization, which hopefully will not be behind the bench, which will be a de- 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 developmental role, as he had previously, as uh, our, our friend Dwayne here has, has said he was coaching 13U, I guess, uh, before this. So it seems like, they are at least self-aware of the mistakes that they've made and they're working to correct them, which is what any organization, what any business, what any person should do when they realize that they have gone down the wrong direction. So another really, really cool thing that I think could be beneficial for the team next season. Yeah, I, I done again, couldn't agree more. And Matt Ellis can, you can send that guy to Siberia for all I care. Um, I, I mean, there's, there was almost, I, I know I said, you know, how the hell does he have a job still? But I mean, him and Kevin Adams are like this. So, um, there's no way Adams, you know, was going to fire <laughs> Matt Ellis. He'll find some other role for him in the organization that doesn't involve him being behind Buffalo's bench, put it that way. Um, Speaking on the accountability side of Kevin Adams, um, I, I'm happy that he made this decision. It sounded like it was his decision to make. Um, and yes, uh, there were a lot of issues from a coaching standpoint with this team. Lack of making adjustments, uh, you know, in-game adjustments, um, not recognizing, um, not not. not I almost I almost felt like he did a like a flip complete flip from last year to this year with how he utilized his players and in you know how he wasn't able to put those said players you know with the exception of the guys who were dealing with injuries in the best possible positions to succeed. Um, but and I, I know he he accepted accountability, um, and that that's a word that he used a lot. Accountability is something I've been begging for now for over a year. Accountability, accountability, accountability. Um, and I really, really, really hope that that is at the top of the criteria for whoever this next NHL coach is. But, I mean, does Kevin Adams get enough blame for the way things went this season? I know, you know, it's, you know, it stinks. You never want to see anybody lose their job. But, I mean, Kevin Adams did min- 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 next to nothing in the offseason uh, to get this team to the, uh, over the hump and get them to the playoffs. I think he's received his fair share of blame. And I, I, I think his tone at the press conference today was was pretty self-critical. I, I think he obviously needed to do that, and I'm, I'm glad that he did. And I think he realizes that him going into this season with the same group that almost made it last year and just hoping everybody produced at the same clip was probably not the best idea. So I, I felt like he was self-aware today, and he was not only – critical and accountable, but somewhat apologetic for the way that this season went. 
And may, should he have lost his job for it? I, there's an argument to be made, but at the same time, losing both your coach and your GM, going to such a critical off season where your group still obviously has a lot of talent, it's still pretty young, but is not that far off, I think would have been too much to bear for an organization that hasn't necessarily found their footing uh, from a business perspective in a really long time. So I am glad that he's going to have another opportunity because he does generally seem like a pretty smart guy. He's he's made really good trades in the past. He's he's drafted well. He's made some good pickups here and there. So giving him one more shot this offseason to work with a new coaching staff, not only a head coach, but likely a few different assistant coaches as well. It seems like Mike Bales is going to be there for the for the goaltenders. So that's a positive in the, in the right direction. Uh, he's, I think, largely considered one of the best goalie coaches in the league no matter where he's been. So I think that's another good move, keep retaining him. And then, yeah, then you then you have that foundation and then you go into the draft, you go into free agency and you do whatever you can to improve this team. And given how badly they failed in terms of additions last off season and even during this season, I think hopefully that will encourage them to do the exact opposite, to package uh, picks and, and prospects, to offer guys uh, term and, and money that are proven NHL players that can come in and help this group. So, yeah, I think he, he got some of the blame. I think he recognized it. And this is a critical offseason for him because if he does the same thing or if he doesn't do enough, then he's going to be out of a job as well. So, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens there. But I'm, uh, I'm glad that he's going to have another opportunity to, to write this ship. Assuming that the players all watched his press conference today, um, I'm not sure how they received the news about Don's firing. If they found out how we found out, I'm assuming that, you know, there was some type of maybe even like a zoom call, some type of message said to the team, um, or when Don even found out, um, I, I, I mean, again, it happened less than 24 hours after the final game of the season. Um, how do you feel like this message was received by the team? This is a team that said that, you know, they had Donnie's back. They loved playing for him. You know, what other, what, for whatever reasons they were, we can speculate, you know, is it because they, you know, embrace his philosophy from last year because, you know, Kevin Adams made, made a point of it many times that the system did not change. It's just the players just weren't prepared enough. They didn't execute it. It didn't seem like they were prepared uh, almost from training camp, which is a huge concern to me. But, you know, how do you think this message will be received by the team? Um, a guy like Darlene, who will now be on his fourth head coach in seven years um, with the team, almost, I think those are Eichel numbers. When Eichel was on his fourth head coach when he when he uh, finally left Buffalo, um, you know, how, you know, how are they going to receive this message? They, they seem to have liked Donnie. And, you know, what type of coach do you feel in, in terms of what Adam said? You know, he wants a mixture, a blend of both a guy who's going to be assertive and accountable, but knows how to adjust to the times. Like how, how, how do you feel like they reacted to it? Um, when you, you know, when do we think they found out and you know, who is the best, like what type of a coach, not who, but what type of a coach is the best fit for this team? I think they're definitely blaming themselves. I think you can kind of gather that from how they responded to the fire Donnie chance earlier in the year after the Columbus loss. They obviously got upset and they took it personally, but I think internally they know that they didn't play well enough this year in front of Donnie, combined with the, the lack of system or the, the change in system or whatever it may, or the lack of a change in system, whatever it may be. So I'm sure they're all taking it all very personally because on a personal level, I do think they, they all really like this guy. And how could you not? He seems like an inviting, personable coach and he was a player's coach for the most part. When you're a developmental coach and you work with young guys, you kind of have to be. You can't be this throw the garbage can, scream at guys and 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 chide them for every misplay. And he doesn't doesn't really bench guys that often either because I don't think he uh, actually believed in that whatsoever. So yeah, I'm sure guys are pretty upset, but at the same time, they're putting a lot of it on them. And as I would say, self aware as that could be, I don't necessarily think they should do that because I do think there is a balance between executing on the ice, but also being prepared to play from training camp on. And in the beginning of games, I just, I think Donnie's message was becoming kind of stale and these guys were just floating around out there without much purpose. So adding on to that, 
I think you need a guy, obviously, that is a healthy balance, as, as uh, they said in the press conference and as you just said. A healthy balance of, of structure and experience and a clear and defined system, but also having the ability to adapt and to recognize what's needed in the modern NHL, which is a lot of speed and creativity. The best teams in the league have a little bit of toughness. They have a lot of speed and they have a lot of skill. And that's where the game is going. It's, it's way less your, your father's and your grandfather's and your grandmother and your, and your mother's NHL where it was grab and, grab and push, a lot of physicality, uh, ch- check and go. It's way more creative. And those types of young, really skilled players are taking over this league, as we see on a nightly basis. Uh, Connor McDavid just got his 100th assist last night. Austin Matthews, I'm not sure if he has yet or if he's going to. Tonight, he could potentially score his 70th goal, and Nikita Kucherov could get his 100th assist uh, tomorrow night as well. So I think the, the Sabres do have those players, as we saw last season, 94 points from Tage Thompson. And I think they have four 30-goal scorers, five guys with 60 points, and they didn't have one of those guys this season. And I don't necessarily think that's on the players. So, yeah, they're going to take it personally, but they need a guy – that's done it before and has the ability to keep on doing it and keep on adapting to today's NHL. Yeah, it's it's crazy too. I uh, just uh, on your points from a few seconds ago, like you're gonna have potentially two players in the league this year with 100 assist, 100 assists each, which hasn't been done in like 30 years, just by even a single player. I think it hasn't been done since Gretzky. And then on top of that, a guy who's gonna score 70, which I don't think has been done since uh, it was either Solani or Mogilny. Um, absolutely wild. I remember like years ago, it was wild to see a guy get a hundred points. Now, like the norm is for guys like McDavid and Kucherov and, you know, like that. And, and uh, it is 120 plus points. I think this will be like the fourth season that McDavid's scored close to 140 points, which is absolutely in- insane to me. Uh, and speaking of which I think, uh, Reinhardt just scored number 56 which exciting for him, uh, happy for him. And Florida is going to be a team that I'm going to follow for sure out of the East in the playoffs. Going to root for Vancouver, though. Um, I, here, Here's what my thought on it all. I think that they need an in-your-face type of guy, man. I, I just think they do. Um, I, I, I've, again, accountability, accountability, accountability. You need a guy who, you know, again, you don't need somebody to throw a garbage can in the dressing room or kick over a table. Or, uh, you, you know, you know, whatever it might be. But, like, when I say accountability, I want a guy who in the game is going to hold a player accountable for their play. Whether it, you know, I, I've asked, I don't know how many times for certain players to be sat mid-game. That, that, to me, is accountability. And that's the type of backbone I want to see from whoever this next head coach is. And, you know, when I put up that graphic, I know I put Mike Peck up there, even though I left him up there. I didn't, I didn't change, change the photo. But you have Lindy. You have Bruce Boudreaux. You have Gallant. Um, there's other names in there too, like guys who are very well known for help, uh, holding players accountable, both mid-game and you know he'll throw you up in the press box. To me personally, that's what I want. I, I just want that. I'm tired of the kid gloves. Um, I, I, you know, I saw, I saw. I can't remember if it was a tweet or a group chat. It start, you know, back when Bilesma lost his job. It was essentially. The players winning over the head coach. The players didn't like the head coach, so they got rid of the head coach. And realistically, you can say what you want about last year about Donnie, but like that was possibly the close. I mean, not gonna say the closest to a playoff team, you know, that, that we've had in a long time. But like that team that Biles my coach to above five hundred, that wasn't a bad hockey team, and they had very subpar goaltending, and they still found a way to be an, a, a, an above five hundred hockey team, but. The players dislike the coach. Players got their way. I'm not saying that should be the, that that should be the way it is all the time, but it was very well known. The players loved Phil Housley. Phil Housley wasn't didn't have much of a backbone. wasn't able to didn't hold guys accountable. Um, Kruger, players coach, zero accountability unless your name was Jeff Skinner. And now again, we have a guy who we just screamed about it over and over again. Where's the accountability? Um, I, I just, that's what I want. I, I, no more kids gloves. I, I don't care about your feelings anymore. This, I, I, I'm going to take team, the team success over your feelings time and times out of 10. And that's what I want. 
Yeah, I'd have to agree. I think uh, we haven't had that type of guy in a long time, maybe since Lindy Ruff. And what do you know? He's he's available once again. So yeah, I think it's it's about that time, and uh, you can have a little bit of both, but accountability number one. Well, experience number one, added with some accountability, added with some creativity and adaptability as well. And then you got yourself a guy that gives you a good foundation, and you let the players play under that system, under that structure. I think the combination of all those things is is what's needed in today's game. I mean, look at Edmonton, how they started this season with, with Jay Woodcroft. Uh, I know he didn't have necessarily the most experience uh, as a coach prior to that, and you have this team that's so unbelievably talented, and then they bring in Connor McDavid's junior coach, and then they go on this unbelievable run, and they get back to the team that they once were. I don't think the Sabres – are necessarily that far off from that model whatsoever. Like you had this team that was so good offensively that completely lost it this season, but in the process they gained some defensive responsibility and really good goaltending. So you have the pieces in place. You just need them all to come together at the same time, which is of course easier said than done. But at the end of the day, you have the most important thing, which is the players. You have the players that have already succeeded at this level, that have produced at this level, that, that have the ability and also are still very young. So they are not, it's not like they're past their prime. They're not even at the beginning of their prime for the most part. So you have the system in place, you not the system in place, but you have the players and then you just have to create that foundation and move forward. Yep. Um, I'm going to uh, pull some quotes from the presser here uh, via our friend of the program, uh, both Matthew Fairburn and then also uh, Mike Harrington. Uh, Kevin M says there's no doubt that the Sabres locker room and organization is in a better place that uh, I'm sorry, let me repeat myself. Kevin M says there's no, there's no doubt that the Sabres locker room and organization is in a better place than when Don Granado took over, but ultimately it wasn't good enough. We underperformed um, also from uh, more from Kevin M's. Our standard needs to be higher period. No more talk about this being a young team. I love, I love hearing that. Uh, Cause I got sick and tired of hearing all oh, this is a young team. A lot of these guys have been in the, uh, the league for a while. Um, Adams also said that the people who were retained on the coaching staff were retained for a reason, but it will be a conversation with the next head coach, what their roles will all be. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, said he wants NHL experience. We've already been over that. And what, uh, and he also just reiterated experience when it went during a follow-up question. Kevin M said he thinks this team is craving accountability and structure. The time is now. It's go time. It's time to perform on an individual level and a team level. Um, he also, uh, when asked about the injury to Tage Thompson, said it's significant enough for him to miss the Worlds, but it's nothing that would impact him uh, to train over the summer. Would have probably missed a few weeks had the Sabres made the playoffs. Um yeah, I, 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 and I, and I, you know, I agree with all of that. He said all of the right things. He said all of the right things. I just hope it's just not words to make people happy. Um, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I listened to most of it earlier today, and I think that it was about as good of a press conference as he could have had in a really tough situation, because I think he's coming to the fans from a perspective that most of them don't want to hear a word that he says and all that he can do at this point is produce results on the ice in which he technically, aside from putting the guys in positions, he doesn't have a control of tangibly uh, in terms of actually getting out there himself. So he's in a really tough position right now. And I think the good part and something that I'm at least encouraged about is it seems like he has more control and he has more ability to put this team in the direction that he wants than he had previously, which I know we've talked about it many times, but that a, that might not even preclude a, a director of hockey operations at this point to bring a guy in to potentially help him oversee this transition in terms of bringing a guy. Maybe it's a combo of an experienced head coach and a guy he's worked with on the business side or in the front office before. I think a lot of people would be open to that as well. So, I think just stripping it down to, to the core and realizing what went wrong, which I think he definitely did, and also having a clear direction of what he wants, which also seems like he has, is the best possible thing he can do right now. Because as 
unfortunate as, as this season was, I think we can all agree that it's a way better position than openly tanking, than being as bad as they were for a long time, being at the bottom of the league. Yeah, they, they played at a 73 point, point pace for the first three months of this season, but they finished with 84. So they definitely improved. And a good part of that is obviously the, the improvement in the goaltending and the defense and a few good seasons from guys that have developed and they've improved. But this team is still in a position where they have the ability to get to that next level if they add a couple pieces, which I, is not out of the realm of possibility whatsoever. So, yeah, I, I was impressed with the press conference. I think that he did all that he could today uh, moving forward from the end of us, from the end of this season, moving forward in the next. And then you just try to win each day from there. And I think he's going to move pretty quickly. Like, like I said, like, I think we'd all be pretty happy with Rob, Rob Brindamore, but at the same time, he's not going to wait around for him to go to the Eastern Conference final or win a Stanley Cup. So I'm excited to see what happens here in the next week or so, because I do think it's going to happen that quickly. Uh, from Mike Harrington. Yes, my takeaway is that it sounds to me like Kevin Adams is going to head down the road with Lindy Ruff and see where it leads. But there are other guys out there too. I would like to see him talk to at least Craig Berube and Bruce Boudreau. Sabres players, uh, Sabres players talk the next two days. I wonder if that Friday morning slot that they plan for Adams and Granado might turn into Adams and a new coach. The GM said his process was starting this afternoon and also mentioned that when he turned on his, when he looked at his phone because it was on do not disturb, he did have a lot of voicemails. Carlos, who would you hope is in his voice mailbox right now? Lindy Ruff. I would hope Lindy Ruff's in there. I would hope Craig Berube's in there. I would hope all the guys we mentioned, Gerard Gallant, Bruce Boudreaux, uh, even Elaine Vigneault, any of these guys who have coached multiple NHL teams and have had experience winning hockey games, not only in the regular season, but in the playoffs as well. I think any number of these guys are qualified as we said, if this was a job application online, none of us would be qualified as much as we think we might be. You have to have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of games of NHL head coaching experience to be qualified for this job. We said this exact same thing in 2015 with Dan Bilesma. He had won a cup, but he had only coached one Pittsburgh Penguins team with Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin in their primes. So I think that is a different situation to this. And I think everybody wanted Mike Babcock as opposed to Dan Bilesma uh, eight or nine years ago. So I think in this specific situation, you interview all of those guys over the next few days. You see which one you like best, which you even get the player's input. I would absolutely talk to Rasmus Dahlin and Tate Thompson and Alex Tutt and the core of this team, the leaders of this team, and see if they have any input. Because at the end of the day, if these players aren't going to vibe with the coach, this is going to lead us to another situation in two years where we're talking about the exact same thing. So, yeah, I hope there are voicemails from all of those guys. And if there are, I guess, some Sabre retreads, like Jay McKee and Michael Pekka, you you at least listen to that and, and you see what happens. But, yeah, I think we all have a pretty clear focus in mind and it's these guys with NHL head coaching experience. I would say probably one of my favorite quotes from his press conference was for sure. And he, he was pretty, pretty, uh, I don't know if the right word is passionate when he said it, but when he said, we haven't done anything, we haven't accomplished anything, nothing in this league. We haven't earned the respect of the league yet. Uh, not too long after that, there was a lot of talk in regards to guys who regressed. And he, you know, talked, I would say extensively about Dylan Cousins, how the type of player he wants Dylan Cousins to be like, yes. We saw 30 plus goals from him last year, but is Dylan Cousins the type of guy that's going to help this team more if he scores 25, but is out there blocking shots, throwing hits, and the type of player he would like to see Dylan Cousins be is that after every single game, that other center that you were matched up against, do they come out of that game saying, "Holy shit, man, that I I, I that was miserable to go out there and play against number 24." And I, I tend to agree. I, I tend to agree because I've always compared him to a guy like Michael Peck. I've been said it over and over again. They play similar physical styles of hockey, similar centermen, 
Dylan Cousins just has much more uh, finesse and skill. I don't know if the right word is finesse, but still, you know what I mean. Um, I, I like hearing that that he didn't necessarily like single out a guy, but he went extensively into the type of a player like Dylan Cousins wants to be. And who is the coach that's going to get that out of those particular players? Just using him as an example. One thing I do want to say, piggybacking off, I know, again, it was Jim Murphy uh, on Twitter who kind of leaked this the night before. We weren't really sure how to feel about it, and then it happened. Paul Hamilton did say in the intermission that he does not see Jeff Skinner on this team next year. Um, do we think that could come true? And would that be due to a coaching change? A guy who, hey, like we talked about Rod Brindamore when, when Skinner was at Carolina. That's probably why Skinner was no longer with Carolina. Rod Brindamore did not want him playing on his hockey team. Um, do we see this coaching? How, how will this affect the roster next year? You know, depending on like the type of coach that they want um, for guys like a Jeff Skinner or a Peyton Krebs or, you know, fill in the blank, Henry Yoki, how are you guys who are on the bubble of making this team uh, in, you know, next year and beyond, um, you know, how, how will this head coach affect those types of players, especially when the biggest criteria outside of experience is accountability, 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 um, and being tough to play against. He very, he wants this team to be hard to play against. He, he said, there's two different ways of doing that. You can be really fast paced and, 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 and high skill. And, you know, it's tough to play against, or you come into this building, a building that he kept reiterating too. He's like, I know how good of a building this, how how good of a building this that that, that are, the arena can be, and how uh, you know how we can turn you know, how at, at there are times where it really is a home ice advantage. It is advantage to play at home, uh, you know, being your own barn. Um, you know, having having a coat ha having a team like that that's hard to play against. Physical speed, and he said he said he wants a blend of both. But who is the coach that, that's going you know to make those decisions? Um, you know, or make the decisions for guys like that, that are on the bubble, um, possibly be no longer in Buffalo next season. I'm not sure if I worded that as a kind of a word salad. <laughs> uh, to your original point, I do think it's really possible that Jeff Skinner is not on the team next year. I think given how long he's been there and like you said, the type of team that they're trying to build, there's, there's absolutely a chance that if they can find a willing trade partner, someone that is either willing to take that contract or the Sabres work out a deal where they retain some of that salary, I think it potentially might be time to move on. Uh, I'm of the opinion that he can still be of a, a, a value to this team. I, I think there were definitely points this season where he was still a very good goal scorer and he can still be very good in that role specifically. And at the end of the day, you have to score goals. So I'm not completely opposed to him being on the roster next season, but at the same time, yeah, for a guy like him, Peyton Krebs, Henry Yoki Haru. Uh, I mean, I don't know about Zemgin Skirkinson's at this point, but I would say anybody in the bottom six or the third pairing of the D, this should be treated as a tryout, right? Like uh, a guy that comes in, the, the head coach, whoever they pick, is going to bring in his staff, and he's also going to want his guys. He's going to want the guys that can play his system the best, and he's going to hopefully be in constant communication with Kevin Adams this offseason about trading or drafting or uh, signing guys that would fit the way that he wants to play. And then you get into mid-September for training camp and you're going to have a collection of guys that I hope would be like a triple-A tryout that we all experienced growing up or a college team or whatever. The best guys that are going to fit his system and his style of play and his identity for a hockey team are going to make this team. And if you don't, then you're either going to get traded or you're going to get benched because it is a business at the end of the day, and the best 16, 17 guys uh, on a nightly basis, more than that, 20 guys, uh, whatever, however many guys you feel a nightly NHL roster with are going to make this team. So, yeah, uh, this puts a lot of guys on the hot seat. This puts guys that haven't necessarily produced uh, at the highest level for a long time uh, very much so in, in limbo. And maybe that's a motivating factor for a lot of these guys, and I hope it is. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, your top three candidates right now. Uh, I think Lindy, uh, of those that are available, not coaching a team right now. I think Brenda Moore is an entirely different discussion. Uh, well, yeah, yeah exactly. Not counting Brad Brenda Moore. Yeah, I would go, 
I would go Lindy, uh, Craig Berube, and uh, Bruce Boudreau. Uh, I, I would, those are the three guys I've been thinking of um, even before today and definitely since the news came down. But it's three guys that fit all the criteria that we've talked about. They've had hundreds of, had co- hundreds of games coaching multiple teams in the NHL, and they've had success with all these teams. They've had clear systems in place. They're no-nonsense guys. They've, they've all, uh, I don't know if Boudreaux was a player in the NHL, but Berube and, and Ruff specifically played hundreds of games in the NHL as a player as well. They, they know NHL locker rooms. They know how to get to these guys. And it seems as though uh, that they, in the present day NHL, have had success adapting to, to the new game. Berube won a cup four years ago. Uh, as uh, Walt said, Lindy's had success in the past two seasons with a young, very skilled team in, in the New Jersey Devils. Mm-hmm. And I think he was kind of done in by bad management and bad goaltending this past season. So yeah, we, you know, we've, seen what, we've seen what Lindy can do with really good goaltending. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, my top two, I think, would be Ruff and Berube. And I think the, they would be the top two for a lot of people, just given the amount of experience, the amount of success, the pedigree that both of these guys have and the respect that they would immediately garner from every single person in the room as soon as they walk in the building. So I, I would put those two guys at the top and Bruce Boudreaux, I, I would put him there as well because he's had a history of coming into teams like this. Uh, he initially did it with the Canucks only a few seasons ago, uh, coming into a team that didn't have much direction and being a no nonsense guy to put, point them in the direction that they needed to go. So uh, I would I'd throw Gerard Gallant in there as well. Uh, given how well he, he, had, he had done recently with the Rangers and the, and the Vegas Golden Knights. But, uh, yeah, those top two for me, I think, are, are Lindy and Berube. Yeah. And, no, and for me, in no particular, it's going to be Lindy and Berube, one and two, one A, one B, really. Um, your point again, Baru, uh, Bruce Boudreaux, Bruce, there it is, 100% would be in my top five for sure. And then guys like Gar, uh, Gar- Gallant, I'm sorry, uh, Gerard Gallant, and then um, I'm going to throw Todd McClellan in there because, you know, he has had success in this league. And um, I think he would be a sought after coach. Uh, we'll see. We'll see where it goes. If Friday comes and that press conference happens and you see Lindy Ruff sitting next to uh, uh, to Kevin Adams, and maybe I assume Terry Pagula would be there, too, for a moment like that. What is the reaction from this fan base? Do we storm down to KeyBank Center to welcome back Lindy? Um, obviously, Sabres Twitter would absolutely implode. But what is the reaction? I I, I feel like it's going to be like 80 to 85% positive, And then you're going to have the downers. Like, oh, we're doing this again. Like, I don't care. I'm all about it. Bring Lindy home. Yeah, I really hope it doesn't happen this Friday because I'm going to be in Austin, Texas at a bachelor party. So that would be a tough way for me to consume the news. But uh, if it does happen, as you said, I think it would inject some life into this fan base, into this organization, into the city that is much needed right now. And just from a purely, purely vibes perspective, emotion, as you say, finish the story. It is the top wrestling storyline. It is the guy that didn't quite succeed the first time around but he goes somewhere else. He goes to other places. He goes to the place that was the ultimate heel in, in the Sabre storyline in 1999 in Dallas. He goes to New Jersey, which had so much success in the late 90s and early 2000s, right alongside the Sabres. And then he comes back home and he does it with a completely new group with guys that he's never coached before, but he clearly knows and has coached against in this league. That would be one of the best stories that's happened to this franchise if he were obviously to bring this team to the next level and and break the uh, 13 year drought. So yeah, I for one would be ecstatic. And I think not only with the storyline, just looking at it logically, it makes sense for this group at this current moment. There's a chance it doesn't work because there's a chance anything doesn't work. There's a chance that maybe this isn't the right group. Maybe this isn't, isn't the right core and they're gonna have to get rid of some guys if this really, really implodes. There's always a chance of that, and we are not future future tellers. Like we, we cannot predict exactly what's going to happen. But with the information that we have now, with the players that currently exist, and hopefully with the additions that are coming this summer, I cannot find or cannot think of a better coach that could be better for this group right now than Lindy Ruff. 
Yeah, I, I got. I, I couldn't agree more. Or else, um, and, and I'll say this about Lindy too: is there's a guy who knows the fan base, knows how to get, knows how to get that building going, uh, just knows, just from a fan's perspective, knows what the success of this team, not just the, the success of this team, but knows what what it means to us as fans to go out there and put in a hundred percent effort every night. So we come out of games knowing that they left it all on the ice. He knows what, exactly what that means, both as a player, as a coach. And I don't think there's any guy out there available right now that's going to do whatever it takes as a coach more to, to, to get this team to the playoffs and to win a Stanley Cup more than Lindy Ruff because it's going to just mean, mean so much more to him doing it here in Buffalo. And on top of that, how much more it'll mean to this fan base that it was that guy finishing the story, uh, getting this team over the hump. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as I saw the uh, comparison for, of Cody Rhodes to Josh Allen for, for this upcoming football season for the bills and the seasons thereafter, in terms of him finally beating Patrick Mahomes and getting the Super Bowl and honoring those great teams of the past that were never able to get it done, finishing the story for the bills. This would be the equivalent for the Sabres, uh, a guy who was drafted by the Sabres, who played a number of years with the Sabres, wasn't able to win a, win a cup, brought a team to the cup, probably should have brought two more in, in 05, 06, and 06, 07, and then obviously got a got a pretty raw deal on the way out and, and fizzled out in a way that I think was a little bit premature, and it was at a time of transition, obviously, after Terry Bagula took over the team, and look what's happened since. So I think they're – is an opportunity here to right the wrongs of the past, to bring a guy back, as you said, that knows the city, that knows the fan base, that that knows the organization. And it would take a lot of the groundwork and a lot of the, the legwork that a new, a new guy that's never been here before out of it just from the get-go. And he can come in and get to know these guys and instill his systems, instill his, his coaching acumen uh, over the summer and really hit the ground running. So I'm completely on board if nothing else for vibes in the story. But as we said, and we will continue to say, as you, as you think about this logically, this does make sense, even if you remove all of the emotion and all of the history. So I encourage Kevin Adams to at least, uh, I know he's going to have that conversation. Maybe he's already had that conversation. And if it happens on Friday, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have to leave the bar for a second and uh, celebrate for a little bit with, with everybody. So we'll see what happens. But, uh, yeah, I uh, couldn't be more excited, and we'll uh, we'll see what happens in the next few days. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll give I'll give original uh, photo credit to this one to Corin Teenage Heartthrob at Double Dogger on uh, on Twitter. He was the one that came up with this one. Also a big wrestling fan, I'm assuming. But uh, I love this picture so much. Finish the story. And it really would be finishing the story for Lindy Ruff and the Sabres, everything coming full circle, him being the guy to finally get get this team back to the playoffs after 13 years of no playoffs, you know, since he was fired. So I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more on all those sentiments, uh, Earls. Uh, any final thoughts before we get out of here? Final thought is that I'm glad this happened today. I, I said at one point during the day, I think it was the point where I saw that they were going to hire a power play specialist and that Matt Ellis was going to be given a new role in the organization, that the Sabres are absolutely crushing this offseason thus far. The offseason's only a day old, but we all woke up to news that we weren't necessarily expecting this morning, but we got it in a way that seems swift and it seems self-aware and it seems logical moving forward. And uh, I think all those things point to this organization realizing that they really screwed up once again. And they know what needs to be done to get the team over the hump and to provide the city, provide this fan base, the hockey team that we all deserve and that we all love. So I'm excited. I'm encouraged. Uh, what else is there to be right now? Because it's kind of an open book, but I think we all have a couple options in mind. And even if it's not those options, even if it's a guy that we're not necessarily thinking of, but does have that criteria that Kevin Adams said he clearly wants today, we can go into it with an open mind, knowing that they're trying something that we've all asked for for a really long time. So I'm glad they did it. Uh, it's kind of a blank slate and you can move forward and, and see what happens. But 
Uh, I think today was a really important day in the history of, of the Buffalo Sabres, and I do think it's going to mean good things moving forward. Um, again, agreed with every 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 single sentiment. Uh, the Capitals just scored on the empty net. The game was tied one to one between them and the Flyers. Three minutes left. The Flyers pull their goalie because they obviously need the win in regulation. Um, pull their goalie. Um, big save by Lindbergh, and then it's TJ Oshie who uh, bursts down the wing and finds the back of the empty with three minutes left. Also, uh, a few minutes ago, the Red Wings tied the game, I believe, at four. David Perron with three and a half seconds left to keep their playoff hopes alive. So a lot of interesting hockey going on right down to the wire here in the out of the East. Uh, definitely going to go check that out as soon as we get out of here, else. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. The Red Wings, uh, they are making it way harder than it needs to be on themselves. If anyone saw the game last night, they were down four to one to the Canadians. And yeah, they scored with five seconds left again tonight. Oh my God. That is unbelievable. Uh, I can't wait to see that highlight, but um, yeah, hopefully we'll be talking. Well, hopefully the Sabres will be comfortably in a playoff position at this time next year and not have to worry about these scenarios, but this is really exciting. And it was with Lindy Ruff behind the bench with Lindy Ruff. And it's what makes you love hockey. And this time of year and the next couple of months is is obviously the best time that we all remember growing up. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. But, uh, yeah, we'll see uh, We'll see what happens with these teams right now. That being said, uh, this has been episode 154, Two Goalies on Mike, brought to you by Fatty Beer Company, Western York's premier market and tap room, with over 300 beers to choose from and eight different Western York locations. Uh, Fatty Beer offers some of the greatest uh, – vibes in all of western new york when it comes to the bar scene uh live music entertainment and trivia at all eight locations open 11 30 a.m till 10 30 p.m and later both kid and dog friendly and as always buffalo go apparel um whether it's the sabers the bills or any of your buffalo sports apparel needs any any local designs local companies they all go to buffalo go uh for their shirts their hats their hoodies uh make sure you go check them out they carry our merchandise too Go check it out. The Hashik goaded embroidered hat uh, with the with the with the mask on the side. They have an RJ one too, which I'm sad I haven't got my hands on myself yet. Um, but all at buffalogo.com, at Buffalo Co on Instagram and Twitter, at Fatty Beer on Instagram and Twitter, fattybeer.com. I am Dwayne for Connor Hurley. Sabres coaching search begins today, and uh, we will see. Uh, hopefully by the weekend we'll get some more news on that. So you guys take care. Enjoy the rest of the week until we hear from you guys again. As always, go Sabres. Talk to you later.